All right, our next speaker is Susan Harrington. Susan has been a longtime activist in this community. Uh, Ten years ago, for the National Day of Reason, Susan was the one who got the capital steps here and the one who took the fight to the courts to make sure that we actually got these steps. And thanks to Susan's tireless efforts, Idaho Atheist is the organization is today, and our community as a whole is what it is today. Susan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I knew I had to have some water when I was up here because I love to talk. Hello and welcome. I'm so glad that we are here today. Thanks especially to Gary Mitchell, Idaho Atheist President, and everyone at Treasure Valley Coalition of Reason. Dustin, Lauren, Van, Jeanette, thank you for all that you do. <laughs> today is very important. Today we are not only exercising our right to reserve these front steps of this Capitol building, to hold this National Day of Reason. But also, we are making a statement. We are reminding our government officials that they cannot favor religion over non-religion. In their capacity as government officials, they cannot favor those people who believe in prayer over those people who think with reason. Now, you wouldn't know this considering how some of our government officials act and con considering in some of what they say. For example, this last legislative session, again, showed the favoritism of some of our state legislators toward a specific religion over another religion. Some Christian legislators refused to even listen to a Hindu prayer one time. And yet these same Christian legislators expect everyone else to listen to Christian prayers every day. They claim that this is a Christian nation. Perhaps they should re be reminded of the words of John Adams in the Treaty of Tripoli, which begins as the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Our state legislators have shown favoritism toward religious parents over the well-being and lives of these parents' children. They have refused to hold accountable parents who would let their children die for religious faith-healing reasons instead of providing basic medical care for their children. Here's an example. A few years ago, a 15-year-old girl on the Parma track team got food poisoning. Her parents refused to take her to the hospital to have her stomach pumped. The girl vomited so violently her esophagus ruptured, and eventually she went into cardiac arrest. She died an agonizing death while her parents watched, prayed over her, and watched her die. Food poisoning. This girl doesn't get to have a life because of food poisoning because her parents believed it was God's will. Well, what do you think the girl wanted? Do you think that if it was up to her, instead of her parents, she might have wanted to go to the hospital? She might, have, she might have wanted to live? I don't know, but there is no reason for her to die. There are other stories, including the deaths of children from untreated urinary tract infections, untreated pneumonia, untreated type 1 diabetes, and on and on. Preventable deaths. There's a whole cemetery of these unnecessary death, it, deaths. It's called the Peaceful Valley Cemetery, and it's about 30 miles from here. Idaho is one of only six states that still allows this. Where are our state legislators when these children need them? And where are some of these same government officials today? They are not here with us to support the National Day of Reason. No, they are with the National Day of Prayer folks. Again, showing their unconstitutional favoritism for religion over non-religion, for prayer over reason. We are all citizens, and no citizen should be looked upon as second class or less worthy because of their religious opinions, because their religious opinions are not in the majority. Remember Hypatia. Remember Copernicus. Remember Galileo. Remember Charles Darwin, just to name a few. Remember all the brave men and women who have logically presented and then stood up for their less than popular ideas. Those who have been persecuted or killed for their less than popular ideas. Those whose less than popular ideas have turned out to be correct. The earth is not flat. It is not the center of the universe. 
Natural selection does happen. So yes, today is important. And you know every day is important. We must continue to stand up every day for our rights to be treated as first-class citizens, regardless of our religious opinion. We must educate ourselves about the law and speak up, or better yet, write letters so that we have a paper trail to either uphold existing laws protecting our rights to our religious opinions, or to change laws to prevent religion from trumping a person's right to have a government that does not favor religion, let alone one particular religion. We must continue to be vigilant, and not only with the government officials who work inside this Capitol building, the governor, the state senators, the state representatives, but also with the government officials who work inside our schools, our superintendents, our principals, our teachers. Now, I am a teacher, and I can tell you it is one of the hardest jobs. Anyone who says otherwise hasn't tried it or hasn't done a good job at it. I'm talking about the day in and day out job of trying to inspire students to learn day after day after day. Teachers have hours and hours of contact with children and subsequently have a great deal of influence on these children and specifically with the minds of these children. Children are, to use a legal phrase, a captive audience. Therefore, we must make sure that these children are not subjected to religious indoctrination or that they are made to feel as outsiders or be subject to ridicule or bullying from their peers. No child should be singled out in any way or expected to defend his or her most personally held beliefs and opinions, be they religious beliefs and opinions or otherwise. It's hard enough as adults to stand up for what we believe in. Children shouldn't have to do it. Here are some specific examples of how we can help. First, the Pledge of Allegiance. The pledge was originally written in 1892 as a 400-year celebration of Columbus's 1492 uh, landing in the New World. It was written by Francis Bellamy, who was a socialist. I find this interesting because the people that are usually pushing for the rote recitation of the pledge are usually on the other end of the political spectrum. The original pled, pledge read as follows. I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do you notice what words are missing? The words under God. They were not added until 1954. They were not added until 62 years after the pledge was written. The pledge actually went through another change. In 1923, the words my flag were changed to the words the flag of the United States of America. Then finally, in 1954, Congress added the words under God in reaction to the Cold War. Francis Bellamy's daughter objected to this change. So today our pledge reads, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now you may have noticed I didn't pause where it has become tradition in classrooms all across the nation to pause. Usually when people recite the pledge, they pause between one nation and under God. But this pause is incorrect with how the pledge is grammatically written. There is no comma between one nation and under God. So why the pause? Maybe because adding the words under God has made it awkward. Or maybe to emphasize the words under God and make them stand out a little better. Who knows? My point is that the Pledge of Allegiance has been and can be changed. It has been and can be questioned. We're not told this in school. We're told to stand up, put our hand over our heart, and say the pledge. I remember saying the pledge in third grade. I remember feeling weird about saying those under God words. But I was a good little girl, so I just said them. Every morning I felt weird. I felt different. I have another memory of being in ninth grade. Again, every morning we had to stand and say the pledge. This time, however, I was silent during that phrase, under God. I did not want to say those two words. When the student next to me noticed and asked me why, I told him I didn't believe in God. Now, it's hard enough to be in school. Many students feel different as it is. It's sometimes an awkward time in our life. We're unsure about a lot of things. We're trying to find ourselves, trying to figure out who we are. But for the most part, most of us are trying just to fit in. So when something like this comes along, a public group 
statement said in unison about the belief in God, it often creates a very disturbing conflict between public image and personal integrity. Why should students who don't believe in God be expected to sacrifice their personal integrity so that they can fit in? Well, this is one reason why I believe some people are so adamant about students saying the pledge in school every day. It may be disguised as patriotism, but it's not about patriotism. It's about religion. It's about making students say those words, or at least listen to those words, under God, every day, day after day. You get the idea. Ten years ago, the Idaho legislature consider, considered a law requiring all public schools in Idaho to start each day with the pledge. Previously, it was hit and miss, depending on what school you happen to go to. I was the only person to testify against this law. I testified that there were other ways to illustrate, to illustrate patriotism to our students. There were heroic stories to tell, and there were inspiring documents to read, like the book for younger students by Esther Forbes about Johnny Tremaine, or for older students, there was Thomas Paine's Common Sense Pamphlet. I testified that there there, these were better ways to illustrate patriotism than the rote recitation of the pledge, especially since some students objected to saying the pledge. When I finished, one legislator, one le legislator spoke up loudly. He said, who wouldn't want to say the pledge except for some pinko commie? Really? This was 2005. He must have not known that in 1943, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on a case in West Virginia involving Jehovah Witnesses. In West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett, the court ruled that students cannot be forced to salute the flag or say the Pledge of Allegiance in school. This was a significant court victory for the Jehovah Witnesses, whose religion forbid them from saluting or pledging to symbols, including symbols of political institutions. Now say what you will about Jehovah Witnesses, but I am glad they won this case. There have been more recent challenges to the pledge that have not been as successful. The Idaho legislature did pass this pledge law in 2005, but they amended it slightly so that they could get around the 1943 Supreme Court ruling. This now is in Idaho code. Every public school is to begin its day with either the Pledge of Allegiance or the National Anthem. No pupil shall be compelled against the pupil's objections or those of the pupil's parent or guardian to recite the Pledge of Allegiance or sing the National Anthem. As soon as it was passed, I wrote to my children's principal, who is also the superintendent, and informed him of the new law and the choice available. I asked him to choose the National Anthem. So from then on, for another year, until my daughter graduated, and then two years after that, until my son graduated, every morning, the students listened to the first stanza of the National Anthem. Many times it was just a recording, but sometimes various students brought in their band instruments and actually played the anthem for their fellow students over the intercom. For all I know, this practice at this one particular small school in Idaho may still be going on today, 10 years from when it started. I greatly appreciate this principal who was willing to work with me so that my kids didn't have to listen to the pledge every morning. Sometimes, however, there isn't such an amiable solution. Just a couple of days ago on our Idaho Atheist Facebook page, a student wrote in asking whether a teacher could make him leave the room during the Pledge of Allegiance. The student just wanted to sit quietly at his desk during the pledge. The teacher insisted that he had to at least stand up or go out in the hallway. Now, the Idaho Code says in part, no pupil should be compelled to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. What's the definition of what is and what is not compelling to a student? Certainly making a student stand up and thus show respect during the recitation of the pledge or having to go out in the hallway is compelling for a student to conform or face the consequence of being banished. No, students do not need to stand. They do not need to leave the room. Students may sit at their desk quietly while the other students recite the pledge. In fact, students may also raise their fist in silent protest, as long as they do so quietly and do not attempt to disrupt the class. 
If you or anyone you know are having problems with this pledge issue, there are organizations and websites available with information about this, including the Freedom From Religion Foundation, FFRF, and the American Civil Liberties Union. You can write a letter to the school yourself or ask one of these organizations to write a letter on you or your, or your child's behalf. Students shouldn't have to explain themselves or defend their right to opt out. Okay, the next topic, handing out Bibles in schools. <laughs> I remember in second or third grade when walking the few steps from my school to the parking lot where my bus was waiting. At the bus was a man handing out those little green New Testament Bibles. He handed me one so directly that I could not not take it. When the same thing happened to my daughter in fourth grade, which I wrote to FFRF, they wrote a letter to the school. The school attorney, in turn, wrote a letter back and said he would immediately stop the practice. It was a slam dunk. If you ever hear of this kind of situation, handing out Bibles to children at school, it shouldn't get, take much to get it stopped. Part of the reason is our Idaho Constitution, which is one of the strongest in the country in this area, thanks to the fear of Mormon influence in the late 1800s when our Constitution was written. The Constitution of the state of Idaho says, in part, this is Article 9, Section 6, by the way, no sectarian or religious tenets or doctrines shall ever be taught in the public schools. And it continues, no books, papers, tracts, or documents of a po political, sectarian, or denominational character shall be used or introduced in any schools established under the provisions of this article nor shall any teacher or any district receive any of the public school monies in which the schools have not been taught in accordance with the provisions of this article. A few years ago, we had an Idaho charter school called Nampa Classical Academy. It was formerly known as Nampa Christian Academy. It changed its name and applied for a charter with the Idaho Department of Education. In fact, the NCA monograms on the school jackets didn't even need to be changed. Now, this is, this is confusing for some people. Charter schools are actually public schools supported with public money. So they have to follow this, the same rules as all public schools. So when Nampa Classical Academy turned in their annual budget to the Department of Education and someone there doing their job noticed that the school had bought Bibles and were planning to use them in the school, the state began the process to pull the school's charter. The school appealed all efforts of the state and insisted that they had the right to use the Bibles and the Book of Mormon in the school instruction. On March 26, 2013, the state of Idaho won an important legal victory when the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear the case on appeal by the Napa Classical Academy. So although federal case law allows use of the Bible in literary studies, our Idaho Constitution forbids our public schools from using the Bible or other sectarian texts. This creates a, a stronger separation of state and church. The Nampa Classical, Class, Classical Academy, by the way, closed down. I was reminded of this Nampa case last week when I read a story about a teacher in Oklahoma bringing a box of Bibles into the classroom. She put the Bibles on a prominent place on, the de on her desk in the front of the classroom, and she told the students to come up and help themselves. Apparently, it was very obvious which students did and did not help themselves. And the student complained to his mom that he felt very pressured to go get a Bible after most of the other students had done so. This student's mom, an atheist, contacted the American Humanist Association, who informed the school that this passive distribution of Bibles violated the separation of state and church. Consequently, her son was bullied at school. She received death threats and they have decided that they have to move. Interestingly enough, the punchline to this story is that the Christians in the school district claim that they are, in fact, the victims. So this situation was resolved, and the Bibles can no longer be distributed, but sad to say, it's not entirely a happy ending. I really do feel for this family who stood up for their rights, and yet are the ones who feel like they have to move. Another Bible situation that I've often wondered about is a situation where Bibles are not only in school libraries in the first place, but that they are placed on the, in the non-fiction sections of these libraries. 
I was once advised by by a national organization to ask the school to move the Bibles from the nonfiction section to the fiction section. I never did do that. But I'll tell you what I wanted to do. I wanted to alert the school in writing and including all the appropriate word-for-word Bible quotes about pornography that was in the Bibles that were in their libraries on the, in the nonfiction section. Now, I never get around to doing that either, but maybe someday. In the meantime, yes, you do have to pick your battles. And sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, but it's important at least to try. Okay, here's one more win for Idaho, as long as it's carried through. Evolution. Evolution is the foundational building block of all the biological sciences. It's some, it is sometimes taught in middle school life science classes, but it is almost always expected to be taught in high school biology classes. In Idaho, evolution has been required to be taught in Idaho public schools since the Idaho State Science Achievement Standards were finally approved by our legislature in 2001, following years of committee meetings and legislative testimony. The meetings and testimonies began in 1998, and perhaps you can imagine the tension and passion that existed on both sides of the argument. It could have gone either way, really, and it did go back and forth. But fortunately, it ended on the side of science, on the side of reason. And evolution must now be taught in our Idaho public schools. The question is, is it being taught? I've heard some pretty strange stories about how some science teachers try to get around the issue. It's our job to hold them to the task of their responsibility to teach evolution to our students. As the old saying goes, we're not in Kansas anymore. And here's one more kind of loss for Idaho that is somewhat a happy ending. Twelve years ago, some students from Eagle High School contacted Idaho atheists and said they were having trouble forming an atheist club at their school. They said the school had a Christian club, but that the school was giving them a runaround for them trying to form an atheist club. The officers of Idaho atheists wrote, signed, and delivered a letter to the school, and they tried to meet with the principal in person. But when all the officers showed up at the school for the appointed meeting time, the principal had unexpectedly had to leave. Figures. <laughs> we were trying to set up another meeting, trying to request another day off for all of us to attempt another school meeting during school hours. But since the students were going to graduate later that year, and their time and effort and energy was limited as well, they decided not to pursue forming an atheist club. So that was the loss. However, here's the win part of the story. We were able to have these students as guests on a Treasure Valley public access television broadcast. They were able to tell their story and hopefully educate the public about the unfair discrimination they had faced. They were on the airways and ho being seen and heard by hopefully thousands of people. We all felt something positive had been accomplished by their being able to tell their story. All of these stories I've shared with you today reflect hard-fought battles, and similar ones and new ones are still being fought every day, even if it only takes one letter to resolve an issue, even if you remain anonymous and have someone else, like a national organization, write that letter. You still go through an emotional roller coaster and constant balancing act between what we should do, how we should do it, and what risks we have to take. We have to keep trying, though. We have to do it, we, the adults. We have to stand up to any government official at the state level or at the school level or anywhere in between who would do something that favors religion over non-religion. We have to let them know that we are here and that we care. Okay, now with all this talk of school, I'd love it if we had time for a quiz. But I have a lot of quotes, and we could... We could uh, try to guess who said what. But for now, let's just try one quote, okay? Who said this? Question with boldness even the existence of a God, because if there be one, he must approve of the homage of reason more than that of blindfolded fear. Who do you think? Thomas Jefferson, thank you.
Thank you very much, Susan.